Good afternoon. My, my name is Tony Brown. I'm a senior fellow at the Institute, formerly the chair of a long-running group on the Balkans. Um, and uh, you're very welcome uh, to this session um, on the uh, reopening, as it were, of the debate and discussion on enlargement. Um, I, I think the, one needs to start by do, doing the um, formal things, asking people to uh, turn their phones to silent, though the official policy of the Institute is that uh, you're invited to tweet if you feel so inclined during the proceedings, and also to, to formally note the exits, which are the entrances, in other words, where you came in is where you go out uh, as quickly as possible. But uh, as I say, this um, session is, is bring, bringing us back in the Institute to a, a, a discussion on issues surrounding enlargement, which has been a theme in the Institute very much since the beginning. I participated in, in a, a group chaired by the, the late Brian Lenahan Sr., uh, which dealt with enlargement, which meant the arrival of the after countries in the 90s. And uh, for the first decade or so of this century, we had a regular group on the Balkans, uh, which met pretty well monthly and, and which produced a, a regular printed report on, on developments in the Balkans, which came to an end when the Juncker Commission said no more enlargement on our watch. And uh, since then, we have kept an eye on the, on, on the uh, developments. But we are now in a situation where there have been certain recent uh, developments which require <coughs> our attention. You're all welcome. It adds to the attendance. Uh, just to say that <coughs> in, in the um, last two or three months, we've seen a progress report from the European Commission recommending the, the opening of talks with Northern Macedonia and Albania, while there have been, of course, talks going on with Montenegro and Serbia. Then we had the General Affairs Council in, uh, twice during June and in October facing a new situation brought about by the strong, determined opposition of France to the opening of talks. The European Council in October was unable to agree on the opening of talks again in the face of a view taken in Paris. The European Parliament followed up by a resolution calling for talks, saying that the failure to open the talks with these countries would have implications for the European Union's credibility in the region. And then, most recently, within the last <coughs> fortnight, the appearance of a, what is called a non-paper from France, suggesting reform of the accession process. So suddenly, issues surrounding enlargement as a whole, and the Western Balkans region in particular, <coughs> have come on the agenda. And to discuss this, we are in a very happy position of having two speakers this afternoon who are precisely the, the right people to talk to us about this. Professor John O'Brien, who is the Jean Monnet Chair in European Integration Studies in Maynooth, and also the Chair of the Maynooth Centre for European and Eurasian Studies. And John's uh, work in this area is, I think, well known to everyone who has an interest in it. He's written widely on it, including uh, publications on, for the Institute. And Pat Kelly from the Department of Foreign Affairs, who is the Director of Enlargement and Western Balkans Unit, and is, has served as Ambassador in the region, representing Ireland in Hungary, Kosovo, Montenegro, Slovenia, and Bosnia-Herzegovina. So uh, these are the, the people who know and who have, will have something considerable to contribute. I think it's very important that we uh, get to grips with this issue because it's on the agenda. It's highly politically uh, controversial, and uh, it's also very important that we tease out where Ireland stands on, on this issue as, 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 it, as it moves forward. So what we'll do is uh, I'll ask John to speak first, uh, setting the scene for us, looking at, at the overall 
picture on the on the political d dimension of it, and then asked Pat Kelly specifically to talk to us about the Irish position and uh, where we stand in, in, in the debate. And uh, we will hope to have time at the end for some uh, discussion, and we'll deal with that when it comes. So, John, would you like to start and uh, bring us up to date? Thank you very much, Tony, and thank you very much to the Institute for inviting me. Um, I want to do just three things today. First of all, ask where are we now with the enlargement process? Uh, secondly, to look at the French proposals, the non-paper and some of the attached uh, elements. And thirdly, to ask, you know, uh, where do we go in the future? So where are we? Well, in 2014, I published a piece in the European Foreign Affairs Review in which I argued that the process was flatlining. Uh, negotiating chapters had been opened, but there was no progress being made. This mood of enlargement fatigue had really taken root right across the European Union. It had first appeared during the debates around the Constitutional Treaty in 05, and then uh, it sort of spreads throughout the EU. And um, that was 2014. I think we're now in a much worse place indeed. And I would say, actually, that the process has now come to an end that a process that goes all the way back to the 1960s uh, and has sort of come full circle geographically, the last piece of the European jigsaw, as far as I'm concerned, is the Western Balkans, which, remember, is geographically surrounded by European Union member states. And the EU has said, we are perfectly prepared to keep the Western Balkans in a deep freeze in the antechamber to membership for the indefinite future. Uh, now, um, where do we begin? Well, I think in February 2018, because that was the point when the European Commission effectively relaunched the process. You may remember that the Commission, as the sort of line manager for the process, um, was charged with monitoring progress going back to the Copenhagen criteria in June 93. They published annual reports on each candidate and would-be candidate state and a composite report. Now, that hadn't happened for a while, but in February 2018, we get a full set of reports and a composite report. And it was really interesting that the language was different to that used by the Commission previously. It was quite stark and confronted a lot of the difficult uh, truths to be confronted. There was a hope, I think, then, that the Sofia summit uh, under the Bulgarian presidency in May 2018 uh, would really deliver the proper sort of oxygen to take the process forward. It didn't. The Sofia summit was a disaster. And it was a disaster not because of anything the Bulgarians did, but because President Macron effectively said no, not under any circumstances. Are we going to expand further? And I think we've been dealing with uh, that French obstructionism uh, since then. It's got actually worse, in my view, um, because now it's a kind of open and declared opposition uh, uh, from France, where it had previously been uh, at least couched with some caveats. Uh, only yesterday, I think, uh, Josep Borrell uh, suggested that uh, Zagreb 2020 uh, would be the summit where we move things along uh, substantially, where Albania and North Macedonia basis of the Commission's recommendations could finally get the green light to proceed to open negotiations. But in my view, Zagreb 2020 is just a kind of repackaged Sofia 2018. And if it didn't happen in and under the Bulgarian presidency, I don't think it's going to happen next year, not when we have these significant blockages in uh, the Council. Uh, so to the French uh, proposals. I mean, there was a lot of criticism, you may remember, at the European Council summit when uh, President Macron uh, uh, opposed the uh, elevation of Albania and North Macedonia. And I think the onus was sort of uh, put on France to actually declare uh, and set out for people what the reforms might be that President Macron suggested <coughs> Uh, were the answer to unblocking the process. Um, but actually, if you look at the proposals, that's really not the case. And I think we have to actually stand back from this and look at France's uh, position on enlargement over many decades. Remember that in the 1960s, it was France that was opposed to 
the entry of Ireland, Denmark and the United Kingdom. Now let's give them that. They may well have been right uh, about at least one of those three. In the 1990s, it was mainly French objections to Poland uh, and to Romania uh, that presented real problems at the later stages of that enlargement negotiation. So there's a kind of consistency, if you like, to uh, uh, the French position on enlargement. So we might suggest that the way they're behaving now really isn't any different to the way uh, that they behaved previously, but there is a more, there's a kind of assertiveness and even an aggression, if you like, about it that may have been absent uh, previously. If you look at the French uh, proposals, they are really mostly what the European Commission is doing anyway. Uh, and I think what French officials may have done is sort of quickly gone and packaged these things together and tried to present it as uh, a novel and innovative way of unblocking the process. But actually, if you look at the substance of the proposals, the Commission is doing nearly all of those things, whether it's providing uh, financial aid to support structural adjustment, <coughs> public administration and governance. Uh, they make a great play about talking about uh, chapters 23 and 24 of the um, 35 chapters. These are about justice and rule of law and so on. But the Commission has foregrounded those for many years on the back of the uh, concerns about Bulgaria and Romania, that they'd been admitted prematurely and so on. Uh, so I think if you stand back from the proposals, what you see really is uh, actually um, um, what is happening within the process uh, anyway, the French uh, talk about a graduated process based on real commitments and real delivery. And here I think they have a point um, in that there, there does seem to be a real problem, a gap, and academics refer to it as the gap between transposition and implementation of EU rules. And the sense that in Bulgaria, in Romania, and in Croatia, uh, Candidate states committed to things, uh, put lots of things on the statute books, but then either failed to implement those rules or implemented them partially, uh, so that the effect really um, uh, was to damage the overall uh, convergence process. So the, the sort of French proposal sees a gradual and escalating um, series of commitments by the candidate states with um, graduated access then to full EU programs but we have most of that anyway if you think about the Erasmus program uh, about free movement and so on they are all built into the system and they're elements of the system as it currently stands so again I fail to see what's new or what's novel uh, or anything else and I have to say I really think that the proposals from France really were a kind of smokescreen and they were uh, uh, they were presented uh, to disguise the fact that what this was really about was French objections to six new small states, including micro-states like Montenegro, becoming members of the European Council and becoming peer countries in the Council. So the protection of French power, uh, French prerogatives, French interests within the European Union more generally. I think that's a big part of the explanation for this kind of protracted objection to uh, the process. And I think if you go and read Emmanuel Macron's remarkable interview with The Economist three weeks ago, there were all kinds of interesting things in there. His obsession with sovereignty, whether it's at European level or French level, reveals him to be, in my view, not the liberal that he was presented as in 2017, but actually as a kind of hard-headed realist, as a very familiar kind of French president, actually, uh, a Gaullist almost to his fingertips. And uh, here, I think, this is part of the explanation for France's stance towards the Western Balkans, um, that it is about protecting French uh, power and influence within the European Union and not having it uh, diluted at exactly the point when one of the larger member states is leaving. Um, uh, I think that's up for discussion. Some people might think I'm over-interpreting, um, but nevertheless, that's uh, the way I see it. The second issue there is the absorption issue. 
Macron has said consistently that we cannot expand further until the European Union reforms itself. Now, this is about the relationship between the widening process and the deepening process. And this notion of absorption capacity, again, entered the discourse around 2005, alongside enlargement fatigue. And academics have actually paid a lot of attention to this. This was the idea that if you add more member states, you're going to potentially impair the functioning of the council in particular. So it's going to be much more difficult to actually get legislation through the system or to agree on anything. And actually the evidence suggests that hasn't been the case. There are colleagues at the University of Leiden, for example, who've done a lot of work on uh, the transposition and implementation of EU rules. And what they show is not only did the um, European Council not come to a standstill, not only did the Council of Ministers not come to a legislative standstill after 2004, actually in some ways the functioning of the Council improved. So to argue that there is an absorption problem on the European Union side is simply incorrect. It is not supported by evidence uh, in my view. Okay, um, now the second issue here I think is um, about the link between the European Union's promise to the candidate states and aspiring candidate states and the degree of reform entered into by those states. Again, the research is very clear on this. There's a symbiotic link between the degree to which the European Union's promise is taken seriously and is understood to be credible in the candidate states and the pace and the seriousness of the reform process that they then adopt. In other words, uh, elite actors in Skopje and Tirana and elsewhere are only going to download the acquis communautaire and do what the European Union says needs to be done if they believe that at the end of that process they really will become members. And let's not forget that the promise that the European Union made to the Western Balkans was in Thessaloniki in 2003. We're 16 years on from there. And uh, the Macron proposal and Josep Borrell uh, is essentially that these states would remain in the deep freeze uh, for an indefinite period of time. Um, so there, there's a problem here about the credibility of uh, the European Union and it has a direct impact, I think, on the way elite actors behave. I mean, since uh, 1995, since Dayton was signed, you've had this, if we just look at Bosnia, this terrible sort of vacuum where these dreadful ethno-national elites continue to be able to mobilize people on the worst kind of basis, pretending to be doing what the European Union wants them to be doing, uh, but actually behaving in ways that are completely at odds with the kind of uh, objectives of enlargement policy. So in many ways, we actually uh, sustain those kind of um, pathologies, and I think it is right to think about them as pathologies, because there is this great divide and there's a big, big credibility problem. I think we need to get back to the point uh, made at an earlier stage um, in this process by Graham Avery, a very seasoned uh, advisor to the Commission. He said, you know, enlargement is about the us and the future us. Now, I think that is no longer the case within the process. And that's a real problem uh, going forward. If we don't believe that the Western Balkan states are part of the European Union, that may explain why the um, current sort of impasse has arisen and it's going to make it very difficult to move out of there. And again, we could mention Juncker in 2014. I absolutely agree with you, Tony. The moment Juncker said what he said, he removed any incentive any of these actors in candidate states had to do the reforms that the European Union uh, needed done. What about the risks then um, of the European Union sustaining this position? I think they're very significant. First, the potential breakdown in inter-ethnic relations. I don't think I need to spell out what that means in this room. The relationship between Kosovo and Serbia remains extremely uh, difficult. Um, in, within North Macedonia, the relationship between the Albanian community and the majority uh, Macedonian community uh, has the potential to unravel. 
and let's acknowledge the extraordinary efforts made by North Macedonia in particular to um, conform with European Commission requests. And you know, the um, response to that has been to essentially kick Zoran Zaev and his colleagues in the teeth. Um, we could make the same argument about uh, Bosnia, um, the potential resurrection of these kind of imagined communities of greater Albania, greater Serbia, uh, all those things uh, are more likely to uh, materialize if indeed in some cases there's still quite a small risk attached to them, you know, if there's no prospect at all of these six uh, entities becoming members. The second is about further economic decline. Uh, and again, the numbers here are really, really stark. Two in particular, if you look at unemployment rates right across the region, it is absolutely horrendous. Youth unemployment rates of 60, 70 percent. And that has led directly over the last few years to this enormous outflow of people from the region. Um, population of the entire region is about 18 million people, more or less the same as Romania's. Um, but we've seen probably three or four million people just leave uh, within the last five or six years. And it was noteworthy, remember some weeks ago when Tishuk uh, mentioned the number of Albanian requests for asylum in Ireland and the number of Georgian requests. It is really, I think, um, just a, a reflection of, of the deep social distress right across the region that so many people are fleeing. Now, they have diaspora populations that they can uh, go to. There are all kinds of reasons for thinking it's easier to migrate than before. Uh, but now people would not be leaving if they saw there was any prospect of a future. And so the demographic issue, I think, is another one that really uh, doesn't get enough attention. Um, the decline, and it's not just limited to the Western Balkans. Um, Bulgaria's population has gone from 9 million to 7 million. You may have seen in the Romanian general election, a big part of the support for Klaus Johannes was the diaspora, sort of a million people voting for him. You know, four or five million Romanians have left again over the last 25 years. So that's a real significant problem in the region. And I don't think the European position as it stands currently helps, obviously, uh, with that whole range of issues. The third one is geopolitics, uh, the, the third risk. And this is about the presence in the region and the ambitions of the would-be great powers, Russia, China, Turkey, Saudi Arabia. They're all present in the region to different degrees. The Russian strategy is not necessarily to spend a lot of money, but to cause as much disruption as possible to prevent countries joining NATO, for example. They may even have been prepared to stage a coup d'etat in Montenegro. I think might be aware of the parameters of that. Um, so again, if you look at the look at this and re refract it through the security issue uh, in Europe, the kind of unraveling of the security order, and here we might mention NATO as well, um, is another one of these very serious uh, risks that the European Union faces, indirectly maybe, but uh, nevertheless uh, real. And finally, there is uh, the fact that <clears throat> um, if the Western Balkans is to be kept in this uh, deep freeze, uh, you are not going to change the fundamental parameters of power. So the very rotten people in many of these states who have been maintained in power over a very long period of time, uh, they're going to continue doing exactly what they are doing, mobilizing people on the basis of ethnicity and hatred of the other, uh, uh, rather than on the basis of a more normal politics that centers <clears throat> around all the things that perhaps we take for granted. Okay, so what should we do, finally? Well, firstly, I think we really need to reframe uh, the enlargement process and reframe our thinking about the Western Balkans in more normative terms. Firstly, we should recognize that most of the challenges that I've described are not unique to the Western Balkans. Uh, the, the region is sometimes referred to pejoratively as the underbelly of Europe, where you know, all these terrible problems are imported into the European Union. In fact, if you think about transnational organized crime, 
and this is one of the uh, lenses through which the Balkans is kind of viewed, um, you know, where, is the, uh, where are the proceeds of Albanian uh, heroin trafficking groups laundered? It's not in Tirana. Uh, it's not in any part of that region. It is probably in London, in Dublin, in Amsterdam, via a whole series of opaque sort of movements to the Seychelles, the Cayman Islands, and elsewhere. So we should recognize we are a big part of the problem. And where we kind of neatly separate ourselves and divide ourselves very often uh, in making charges against the region, actually uh, there are member states of the European Union that facilitate transnational organized crime in a multitude of ways. So we are far from innocent here. And again, if you think about the Kinahan clan and their kind of multinational presence in Europe, how on earth can you talk about Albanian crime gangs? It seems to me there are all kinds of contradictions there. So this whole kind of criminal ecosystem is what I think we really need to think about as a collective action problem. I don't know if anybody saw the BBC series Mac Mafia, uh, based on the book by Misha Glenny, who'd written a lot about the Balkans in the 90s. It's extraordinary because it just describes this world perfectly. So unless we get serious about money laundering and tackling the root causes of um, the kind of impunity that these groups uh, enjoy, I think we are not going to, to uh, get to grips with uh, the problem. And again, you know, if there is an industrial spillage on the Danube you know, in Serbian territory, that's not a wholly Serbian problem. It can very quickly become a Bulgarian, a Romanian problem, and thus a European Union problem. So I think we have to think about all these issues in collective uh, and cooperative terms uh, rather than the kind of adversarial, adversarial terms that is too often the case uh, currently. So that means getting serious about all these problems uh, putting an end to the sale of EU passports, for example. And again, we've had reminders in recent days, this is not just about Central and Eastern Europe and Southeast Europe. Look at what's been happening in Malta. Look at what's been happening uh, in Slovakia. You know, the murder of journalists, the impunity of criminal groups, very often close to those in power. These are really serious issues, and they go well beyond uh, the region. Uh, finally, we have to get serious about tackling rule of law problems. It's not enough to say we shouldn't have let Bulgaria and Romania join. Uh, one of the reasons that people in power in Central and Eastern Europe are able to do what they do is because the European Union does not use the tools and the leverage it has at its disposal. Remember, it's only very late in the day that we've begun to get to grips with the problem uh, of rule of law abasement in Hungary and in Poland. The Commission was very reluctant originally to use infringement proceedings. It had to be kind of shamed into using those proceedings. Look at the behavior of our big political families. Uh, Fidesz being protected by the most senior people in the European People's Party. The uh, hideous PSD party in Romania being protected by the socialists uh, in the European Parliament and beyond. And the liberals protecting Babish's uh, Anno party, the DPC party in Bulgaria, one of the most rotten and corrupt anywhere in the world. You know, they have to stop this stuff and they have to recognize that there is a responsibility that they have to uphold the values enshrined in Article 2 of the treaties and how on earth can you dictate to candidate states and aspiring states when with, inside the European Union there is whole-scale abuse of the rule of law. Uh, there are all, we might in conversation, come back to some of those instruments uh, that might begin uh, to tackle that problem. I think actually the, the juggernaut is being turned around and the, the EU is slowly getting to grips with the uh, various issues, um, but we need to do uh, a lot more. Finally, I think we should set a date. Oh, finally. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. You, you, it's an academic finally. Uh, we should set a date. Uh, I think we should set a date somewhere around 2026, 2027, on the understanding that all of the uh, countries in the region will enter the European Union at the same time. Um, how do we tackle the kind of problems that I've described? I think 
what, what we should be doing is a troika-like presence in every national capital. And we say to each candidate state, there is a quid pro quo here. You are going to have to accept the deep, maybe unwelcome, penetrative presence of the European Union in your capitals. The Commission sends people into every single ministry. Uh, and we have a, a kind of a purchase or traction that has been... Uh, absent or has been unsatisfactory up to this point. And I think actually there would be an acceptance for this kind of uh, approach within the region because the long-term future of the Western Balkans would then be clearly inside the European Union rather than outside. And we have a moral responsibility. Remember 1991, as Bukovar was being bombed, Jacques Pou, the Luxembourg foreign minister, he says... This is the hour of Europe. Yeah. It wasn't, we know. There is a very inglorious history there, and I think we do have an enormous responsibility, and we should act. Thank you. Mm. John, thank you for a very comprehensive, also quite spirited presentation. Uh, President Macron is looking for people to respond. Certainly you're giving evidence that response is possible. I would just say I had a, I have a, a long-standing friend of mine in the political world who um, decided in relation to issues about timing that at a certain stage in every one of his presentations he would use the word penultimately uh -huh. <laughs> uh, to give himself another few minutes. <laughs> You've talked about the... Uh, the broad issues, and, and you brought it home at the end as to the responsibilities of the rest of the Union. So um, it's, it's very important that we have here a voice from uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs. Pat is going to talk to us about the, the, the Irish position, uh, which is, and it's extremely important as uh, we move forward, uh, hopefully, uh, to the next stage of Brexit that we... Um, pick up something that is being discussed more and more, which is about Ireland's alliances and Ireland's partnerships and how we fit into the um, membership uh, and, and the, the uh, wider family of, of the Union. So, uh, Pat, over to you as, uh, to pick up the Irish dimension of, of, of this important subject. Uh, thanks very much, Tony, and uh, good afternoon to you all. I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to take part in this extremely timely discussion on, on enlargement. Um, like Tony, I'll confine myself to three basic points and uh, I'll try and keep, keep it short so there's enough time for, for Q&A afterwards. Um, firstly, just to, to recall why Ireland is so um, positive and supportive of the enlargement process. Uh, secondly, just to briefly outline where we stand in relation to the current on pass, as it were, in relation to, to North Macedonia and Albania. Um, and then thirdly, just to talk a bit more about our approach or attitude generally towards the Western Balkans. Um, why are we pro enlargement? I mean, I won't dwell overly on this. I, I know there's a former colleagues here who kind of uh, are well versed. Uh, there's no point in teaching your granny to suck eggs. But, uh, but essentially, there, it can be summed up uh, in, in four words uh, as to why we are uh, a pro enlargement uh, member state um, fairness, stability. Um, EU credibility and prosperity. They are, they are the four tenets uh, which we have which guide our, our enlargement policy. Uh, running through them briefly, for fairness, um, you know, we, we have always taken the approach that the EU should be a club which any aspiring member state can join so, so long as they fulfil all the conditions. I mean, that's the, the basic approach we've always taken. Uh, that uh, um, We have approached that, that position in a way, reflects our own experience. I mean, Ireland has, has benefited hugely from EU membership. It's been transformative. Uh, and we feel very much that uh, we shouldn't uh, withhold that opportunity to other member states uh, which could similarly benefit from becoming members of, of, of the European Union. In terms of stability, I mean, I think when we talk about enlargement now, we, we essentially are talking about the Western Balkans region. But of course, we have to remember that uh, it isn't just the Western Balkans. I mean, there is a seventh country in the stable, as it were, uh, Turkey, which is, of course, the, the longest uh, uh, aspirant to, to EU membership. Um, uh, but, I mean, there is now a clear distinction, I think, between the, the Western Balkans six, as it were, and, and, and Turkey. 
Um, um, so in terms of talking about stability, um, I'm talking about the stability of the Western Balkans region because uh, it's still a very volatile region. Um, uh, 20, 25 years on from the uh, lesson we from the end of the, the, the Yugoslav Wars, um, um, you know, th there is no guarantee that the progress which has been made over the past two decades it won't be reversible. I mean, uh, in fact, uh, all the signs are to the contrary that uh, could very easily go into, into reverse. Uh, so it's it's for that important uh, for that set point from that point of view, it's it's very important to maintain the European perspective for the Western Balkans nations because we realise that ultimately the only way, best way to ensure stability in in, in that part of Europe is to. Uh, encourage these countries to make the necessary reforms so that they can join and then in a way be locked into EU membership to be the ultimate guarantee of, of, uh, of, of democracy and rule of law in, in those countries. In terms of EU credibility, I mean, uh, this again goes to um, EU strategic interests. I mean, obviously, Tony has referred to the Thessalonica summit and uh, the commitments we made to the region back in 2003. Um, Obviously, EU credibility has been damaged in, in recent weeks by what's happened in relation to North Macedonia and Albania. But um, you know, Ireland believes very much that it's in the EU's strategic interest to, to expand and to incorporate the Western Balkan countries, uh, uh, ultimately. Um, uh, if the EU doesn't, or if it isn't serious about its um, enlargement perspective for these countries, uh, then EU leverage will diminish very rapidly. And, and indeed, I know from my own time when I was ambassador in Montenegro, the, the, the head of the EU delegation there, his greatest fear was precisely this kind of impasse because he knew it would directly affect how he could manage the, the process of accession in Montenegro and that it would, it would result in damaging the leverage that the EU has over, over Montenegro and I think that probably is, is coming to pass now. Um, so we have to kind of uh, maintain our this EU perspective because other countries will step in. I mean, there are varying views about the extent of the influence of, 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 of other actors in, in this region, uh, but, but they are there, there's no doubt about it. China is probably the most obvious influence, but, but Russia clearly have their interests. Um, uh, Turkey clearly has a great deal of interests, uh, interest in the region, and, and of course the Gulf countries as well. Uh, then in terms of the final issue, prosperity, again, ultimately, Tony alluded to some of the problems, which the economic problems, which the Western Balkans face. So it's in very much in our interest to, to help these countries to reform and to become ultimately market, functioning market economies, which we can ultimately be integrated into the European internal market. Um, and in that way, it will ensure greater prosperity for all. I mean, it will open up equal opportunities for Irish companies. Um, that, in a nutshell, is, is why we, we very much support uh, the enlargement um, perspective of, of the Western Balkans countries. Um, we're not naive. I mean, we, you know, our bottom line is that countries have to fulfil the criteria to become members. Uh, we're not going to compromise uh, on conditionality. I mean, they have to, to measure up to the mark. And I think certainly in terms of some of the newer member states, I mean, we have been very vocal in terms of uh, expressing our views that uh, if there's any backsliding or failing to fully uphold EU values, then, then we would be vocal. And that's certainly the case in relation to Hungary and, and, and to Poland. And uh, um, so um, similarly in relation to uh, enlargement, we expect those countries that wish to become members to, to, to make serious efforts to, to, to carry out the necessary reforms and to seriously uphold EU values in terms of rule of law and, and democracy. Um, that's basically Irish the Irish approach outlined in terms of the current difficulties, the, the, the French veto last month. Obviously, we made clear at the time our, our deep disappointment about, about that decision. Um, we still strongly support uh, the Commission proposal to open next session negotiations. Um, and we very much hope that that can still take place uh, in the coming months. Um, um, obviously, Tony has expressed a degree of, of scepticism about, about the possibility, but um, um, I think we would still feel that, that a green light for opening negotiations is not, is not impossible, um, uh, and we would have hopes that certainly in the first uh, half of 2020 that such a, a step uh, can, can be taken. Um, uh, obviously, um, that brings us to the French position and to the non-paper. Um, what we've been clear all along is that we're happy to consider the proposals which France has made. I mean, they, they have 
their demand at this stage is that the enlargement process should be should be reformed. Um, their papers obviously one which we've closely looked at this stage. I mean, uh, you know, undoubtedly, you know, you can always improve things, and, and uh, I think uh, you know we're largely guided by the response of the commission, and, and uh, certainly we know that the commission are quite happy to kind of. Uh, to re again review the enlargement process and see how it can be improved and they will come forward with proposals um, in, in January and uh, we hope that that in a way will inform the debate as to how the enlargement process can be reviewed but we're quite clear that this has to be separate from the issue of opening the accession negotiations we can't have any linkage between uh, between the two the, the two matters um, and um, that is that is an argument we will continue to make and, and we will hope it will influence um, future presidency and we hope it will uh, uh, inform future decision making within, within the council. Um, um, I think having, you know, France uh, is obviously the chief, uh, chief sceptic in this regard, uh, they're not alone, I mean uh, uh, Denmark and Netherlands are also uh, somewhat sceptical but France is very much uh, in the driving seat as it were. Um, but I think France, France is also conscious that um, um, <coughs> Their veto last month was, was something which um, I think they were surprised by the degree of reaction uh, that, that it met. Um, um, the reality is that most member states are, are, are supportive of, of enlargement and, and the enlargement uh, uh, perspective. Um, uh, there really are no more than probably three countries uh, which, which, which are opposing this. So um, even if you are a big country, that's not a comfortable position to be within council and to be blocking uh, uh, the vast majority of member states. So I think France will will we'll reflect on, on what on the debate over the past month. Um, as I say, the Commission will come forward with proposals next month and we hope that um, that will allow for a, a, a reasoned discussion on how we can improve the process, but it will have to be separate from, from uh, the, the opening of accession negotiations and um, we'll see how France re will react. I mean, it is very much, I think, a matter which is decided at the very highest level in France and I don't think that that's going to change. Um, but um, but I don't think uh, those countries which are supportive of enlargement um, are going to change their views either. And uh, um, I think certainly the new commission will also, I think, uh, uh, continue. Um, well, it'll be interesting to see, uh, but I mean, certainly they have been making the right noises on enlargement. You now have a Hungarian commissioner for, for, uh, for the enlargement process. Um, and Hungary has a very distinct position on enlargement, which is basically that they would like all well, certainly Montenegro and Serbia in tomorrow if they could and pretty much everyone else uh, ASAP now that's the Hungarian position it's, it's, it's probably at one end of the spectrum if, if France is at the other end um, but certainly it will be interesting to see how Mr Varhai uh, pursues his, his mandate over the next five years in fact yesterday he, he stated that he was, uh, his, his, his goal at this stage was to have at least one new member state admitted before his term of office ends in, in, in five years time so we'll see if that's perhaps <coughs> realistic or not. Um, so that's where we are at the moment in the accession process. We're not, uh, uh, I wouldn't say we're overly confident, but we're not pessimistic either that, that we can't uh, get, get us back on track in the first half of 2020. Um, just briefly on, on Ireland's position generally in relation to Western Balkans, it's obviously it's an area where our representation is, is quite thin. I mean, in fact, we don't, we don't actually have any direct embassy presence in any of the six Western Balkan countries are present. We're aware of this uh, gap in, in our network as well. Um, and it's something that's been looked at in the context of Global Ireland, which, uh, as you know, the, the Taoiseach and the government are actively pursuing, trying to build up Ireland's diplomatic presence around the world. Um, so we are reviewing our, our approach to the Western Balkans region. It's, it's, it's a region which you know, we have made a major contribution to over the past 20, 25 years, not least through our peacekeepers. And uh, we continue to have troops serving in, in Bosnia and in Kosovo, and also to remember the Gardaí as well, who've been active in, in, in rule of law missions in, in Bosnia, uh, Bosnia and, and Kosovo similarly. So, um, and there is a certainly, from my own experience, having been ambassador to three of, of the uh, six uh, uh, candidate countries, there is a very warm... Um, disposition towards Ireland in the region and uh, certainly uh, I think there's much we can build on. So um, it's an issue that's been actively looked at within the department and uh, certainly I hope in the context of Global Ireland that we can, we can step up our level of engagement with the Western Balkans uh, in, in the coming months um, and um, uh, certainly we will continue to 
prioritised enlargement uh, because, as I say, ultimately we feel it's, 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 it's very much in the EU's own interests uh, that the EU expand and that, uh, uh, that there isn't a limit set at this stage on, on the number of EU members. Good. Thank you. Well, that was a very clear statement of the, of the position and of the, of the understanding of the, of the, of the, the problems and the uh, time issues. The idea of the new commissioner saying he hopes for one to get in within the next five years is, um, leads to the thought of there's ambition for you. you know, but but, the reality, but it's, it's, it's a statement of reality. Now, if there's some time for questions, the usual conditions apply. Um, state your name and if there's a relevant affiliation or interest that, that would be helpful and um, this session is on the record I think uh, well, quite often here the discussion is off the record but uh, for this purpose uh, we're on the record so, yeah. uh, thank you and uh, thank you thanks to the uh, speakers for trying, trying to get a lot of license in murky areas my question is very simple Sir, name. Conor Murphy, I remember the um, um, where is Germany in all I one time had a, a meeting with the Dan Fogey, the session association, and our French friend played cake on the tobacco page. And I remember asking my German friend, um, how, uh, how did Germany stand up this? And he said very bluntly, Dan Fogey was on the East German border. And now there's no East German border, there are fine things in the United States. But the, the Germans acted very much in favour yeah. of the Spanish Fogey succession, and it has to be a good thing. Yeah, in 1977, when the Commission was asked to adjudicate on potential Greek membership, the answer was negative, and in an interesting reversal of roles currently. But the Germans overruled them uh, on the basis that Greece, returning to democracy as the home of democracy, should have every entitlement to become a member. But um, again, in the 1990s and late 2000s, maybe for reasons of geography and of trade and some degree of self-interest, Germany was very much a champion of enlargement. And it could be argued was the big winner of enlargement if you look at the uh, range of activities of German companies. Um, but more recently, it's been much more schizophrenic in my view, um, where it's generally been more favorable uh, than France. It's become a lot more reluctant, I think, partly because of the huge wave of migration in 2015 and the pressure this has put on Mrs. Merkel uh, in Berlin and in many of the individual lander as the AFD has made ground. Uh, because, you know, many people, when they look at the Western Balkans, they just look at more refugees and kind of nothing else. So I think that's part of it. Um, so these currents of nativism, sovereignism, whatever you want to call them, they're uh, as important in Germany as in France. And I don't discount that in the French case, that that's part of uh, Macron's kind of calculus when he looks at this. Um, uh, the German support now also requires the support of the Bundestag, uh, which, and that was not the case previously. And I think um, that's just one more kind of complicating factor that's made Germany a bit more cautious than it might have been previously. But even there, I think, there is a bit of frustration with Macron uh, that he has been so insistent on this. And again, that could be because German interests are more kind of apparent and immediate. Uh, but I think there's generally a kind of normative uh, disposition in Germany. You know, Germany was divided and then was united after 1989. Uh, a lot of people, when they look at the German position on recognizing Croatia, they think, oh, it's because they were Catholic and part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. No, I think most Germans kind of honorably looked at what was happening and thought, we have the right to self-determination, so do the Croats. And so I think Germany has much more in this to some degree, um, but they will be very important, uh, particularly the next German presidency. Yeah. Whether Merkel is still there or not, they're going to play a very important role. Because if we go back to the end stage of the Eastern enlargement talks, there was a complete impasse. The French really feared Poland having access to cap funds and the, you know, the displacement of uh, France within the pecking order. And it took a last minute meeting, and you, so you're absolutely right, Pat, at the very top level, uh, between Chirac and Schroeder to resolve that problem before 
the negotiations could absolutely uh, be concluded. So I think Germany will be very important. Yeah, just because, I mean, I think uh, absolutely, I mean, I think for Chancellor Merkel, I mean, you can't emphasise too much how much the concept of, of European unity means to her. I mean, uh, I, I know this from having been ambassador in Hungary, that for her, uh, and, and for, certainly for the government she's led, the idea that Europe has to, can't just think about its own western, northern neighbourhood, but I mean, it has to take into account the views of all <coughs> member states uh, and, and has to overcome the divisions. I mm. mean, it, you know, Germany genuinely does not like a dysfunctional EU and it does not like divisions within the EU uh, and it feels it's, it's part of its mandate or its, its mission to sort of try and stop such divisions and, uh, wh where it can. So I think very much that will drive, continue to drive Angela, Angela Merkel as long as she's, she's in office. Um, and I would just, you know, without <coughs> delaying too much longer, I mean, I think it's also important to realise that in terms of Albania and North Macedonia, uh, the Bundestag took a position where they more or less said we will give a green light to North Macedonia, mm. we will give a green light to Albania, but with conditions. Mm. Um, now, that position, obviously, was not sort of accepted, or it certainly wasn't the basis for an agreement in, in the in the council last month, but I think it's it's one that still holds, and I think you know don't take your eye off it because I think ultimately um, it may come back into play um, uh, at some stage uh, next next year because I think uh, I don't think Germany is going to <coughs> to back down. I mean, they certainly privately they are saying they are certainly very still very positive about uh, enlargement. <coughs> and I think um, you know. Um, you know, let's face it, Berlin and Paris don't like being their sluggerheads either, so yeah. if, uh, <laughs> I think France will have to recognise that. Okay. Yeah. Mary, and then, yeah. Thank you both very much. That's really very interesting. I'm just going to Sorry, be another's advocate a bit. Mary, Mary not to introduce yourself. Sorry, Mary, not to the Institute. Um, uh, to the man at the street, it just looks that uh, this has not worked very well in terms of. Uh, bringing countries that have difficulties into the EU. We have Cyprus we brought in rather early and uh, with the hope that it might be unified, it still isn't. Um, there are five countries that still don't recognize, five EU countries that don't recognize Kosovo. Uh, things have gone downhill once we brought in Hungary and Poland uh, and the rule of law there has gone worse rather than better, which would have been the whole. Um, and in Romania, uh, there is an enormous struggle to get things straightened out and, and uh, in terms of corruption. Mm -hmm. So what could we say to people uh, who, not looking so closely at the political reasons, which are overwhelming, I would accept, what are the, how can we persuade people to bring in six Balkan states which have well, Firstly, we were the Bosnia of Europe in 1972. We had a income per head of 50% of the then community average. We had a conflict on our island that was burning up literally by the day, and yet the European Union uh, invited us to become members. Um, so I, I just don't accept the argument that there are too many risks. And if you look at the kind of region as part of Europe and the problems of the region as European problems, then I think you kind of reframe it decisively. On Hungary, Poland, you know, the problem there, in my view, wasn't about EU uh, policy not working after a certain point in time. It was because of the deliberate choices made by elites in Warsaw and in Budapest. Uh, the aesthetic of conditionality wore off. Now, the EU says, well, we didn't have any levers to try and put pressure on either of those states, but it was the deliberate choices of their um, elites that have brought them to this point in time and combined with that the lack of instruments on the European Union side for tackling uh, the uh, democratic backsliding which is you know to be honest this is a full lurch towards autocracy we should be kind of clear about what's happening there's nothing kind of incremental about it it's quite brazen and when the Hungarian foreign minister or where the new commissioner says he wants to bring in uh, new member states, they do. They want authoritarian creeps like themselves beside them in the European Council. That's what they want. And they're, they're quite brazen again about saying this uh, kind of openly. 
Uh, Vucic is somebody they really admire. And, you know, if you, if you do the circuit in Brussels, Vucic has a very good reputation. He shouldn't have. I mean, the, the, the mimetic kind of qualities, if you compare Orban and Vucic, are kind of extraordinary. Um, so, again, I think we do well to not separate the region kind of mentally and cognitively. And if we do think about Europe inclusively, I think we come to very different conclusions about the range of problems. And if the problems are specific to Hungary and Poland uh, or to Romania, there are solutions for these things. For example, linking the dispersal of structural funds to rule of law performance, which is something that is now seriously on the agenda, supported by Germany and many, many other member states. The MFF negotiations are incredibly difficult. We know that. Um, this is one added element that's going to present more difficulty, but I think we have to do it. And if we do it, then I think that will have a very chastening kind of impact. In addition to that, the new uh, position of European public prosecutor, I think potentially, is going to be very important. It's really interesting that it is a Romanian national, Laura Cadruda Covesi, a uh, heroic figure in my view, for standing up to the crooks in her own country. Uh, for that, they opposed her nomination to this position. Now, this is, a, this is an opt-in uh, agency. I think it's going to become a permanent agency, and it'll become a really important um, body for fighting the kind of uh, corruption in the dispersal of EU funds that's been associated with Orban and his cronies, for example. So I think there are mechanisms, there is leverage there, along with the use of infringement proceedings. If you just notice how much more willing, after the Article 7 procedures were opened against Poland in late 17 and against Hungary in the autumn of last year, the Commission is using infringement proceedings much more frequently. And I think that's another way in which we... But those are things that are internal to the EU. I don't think re really that we can put all of that on the candidate states and say that they are kind of perennially diseased and we just shouldn't bother with... I know that's not what you're saying and I'm, I wouldn't dare to put those kind of words in your mouth. But I think that is a common kind of view. Pat. Yeah, and just briefly, <clears throat> the economic argument as well, I mean, sort of, you know, an argument, you know, it's been fairly said is, is it's not a matter of importing instability it, it's rather a matter of exporting stability and, and the reality is that i mean unless we hold out the prospect for these countries to be eventually become eu member states and to have you know to to to, to become more prosperous um, we will continue to have basically the brain drain from central and eastern europe uh, to, to western europe i mean the reality is that um you know it's still a problem even in those the newer member states and um, i know this well but um Ultimately, we have, the EU has to come up with instruments which will ensure that there is convergence. And I mean, you know, from our own experience, that that is what can happen. And obviously, it becomes more difficult when you have a larger union. But I mean, it, it is the ultimate challenge. But I think it, the only way, if you want to stop migration from these countries, and um, you know, to Ireland or to whoever it does, you know, you have to give people a reason to stay in their countries and, and to have a to have a to, to have a livelihood. And ultimately, uh, the the accession process and, and membership is the best way of guaranteeing that. Yep. Two, are there two, just I'll take two more questions because we're running out of time. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, John Leary, member of the Union of 7 Rules of the Union. Um, when people talk about enlargement, it seems to me that there's an unspoken assumption that what we are talking about is the Union increasing in size. In other words, the number of member states increases, the population increases, but otherwise the Union stays the same. And the assumption is that if the applicant countries accept the Copenhagen criteria, then they will join in a seamless way and nothing will change except the numbers. But of course, experience shows that that isn't the reality. And uh, 2005 or 2004 accession uh, threw up a lot of problems that should have been, in theory, uh, solved by the accession process as well. And the American process has talked about some of those a few minutes ago. So it seems to me that in any discussion of enlargement, we should be asking the question, what impact will this have on the union as it is now? And what will the union that emerges through this enlargement look like and how will it function? And it seems to me, although I have no inside information on this, but it seems to me that that is what Macron is doing. He's posing the question, uh, perhaps in a different way, but essentially asking what will the impact of enlargement be on the union? 
And uh, John O'Brien said that he's concerned about the impact of French influence. It's, that seems to me a wholly legitimate point of view to hold, and a wholly legitimate question to ask. And indeed, it's one that we should be asking as well, because we are facing a region that reaches much more to the east than at the moment. Uh, six new member states, in which we have very limited relations. And it's interesting that having opened 25 embassies or other missions in the last few years, we haven't yet opened a single one in any of these accession countries. So that suggests to me that our national interest in the country is still uh, quite slight. Um, there's also the question of, of money, because these states are much poorer than the European average. Uh, they will have to require a lot of transfers in Europe. Where is that money going to come from? We're seeing at the moment the debates on the, the next budget, which are not going to go in easily. Uh, so I think there are a lot of questions from the point of view of the union that need to be answered. I accept everything that John said about the, the moral imperative, <coughs> the practical imperative of helping these countries. But we don't help them if we take them into the union and it's process. So, sorry, could, could you? Yeah. <laughs> he was yeah. right at the end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he was, yeah. Okay, um, <coughs> two hopefully very quick questions. Um, just sorry. In, oh, sorry. Oh, uh, Roman Chan British uh, Trinity College. So, uh, two quick questions in relation to uh, some of Macron's other joint comments recently. Um, for example, his description of Bosnia as a ticking time bomb. Um, not terribly original, but um, but this was in reference to uh, returned jihadis. Islamic State fighters, whatever, of which there is a, a much smaller number in Bosnia than there are in France. Um, but just that, to, one question is, um, to what extent is Islamophobia and to an extent a more general fear of migration as a media consequence of uh, EU enlargement um, impacting on policy? And then more specifically, particularly in the Bosnian case, um, how is EU lack of engagement actually creating and kind of fueling a ticking time bomb of a much more kind of local um, origin in, in terms of exacerbating international uh, tensions, those kind of imagined communities. We have genocide denial in you know, full swing on the Serbian side and also the Nobel Prize being awarded to a genocide absolutely, denial. Absolutely, absolutely. And also the glorification of uh, called work animals, um, you know, just to mark the anniversary of a certain person's demise. Um, so, on those two issues, just your thoughts, which have been really um, enlightening. Okay. Um, so, do you want to go first? Will you, will you go first on this one? On okay. these one, on the two? Right. <laughs> um, look, well, John, I mean, no, um, in terms of your comments about. Um, Again, I mean, you, know, you, you can certainly kind of put that argument that sort of that I mean, you know, surely this is only going to lead to a kind of a maybe in a way sort of a poor EU, given that you have you know, missing small and at the moment poor member states. Um, but you know, I think in a way enlargement. So you can never completely put a, a terminus or, or a limit to it, but I mean, to some extent, you know, these six countries are, I think, somewhat different from, from everyone else. I include Turkey in that because I think, you know, there is a clear distinction now between the Western Balkans and Turkey in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think Europe does have a, an obligation to, to these countries, and I think, um, you know, if we turn our back on them, then they will just become, you know, the negative trends that are there, and some of them will just just become far worse and ultimately it will come back to bite us and, and, and I think that's, that's, that's the bottom line. So it's, it's a, um, of course it's going to require more resources and of course we're now a net contributor but I mean I think you know, um, the thesis has been very clear now certainly in relation to the current EU budget that we need to sort of you know, stop looking at this really in kind of accountancy terms or sort of you know sort of we have to pay more and less. You know, you know, we have to realise what the benefits of the EU are and, and and uh, um, certainly in terms of the way we're approaching the current budget negotiations, that's what we're saying, that people have to realise that sort of, uh, okay, we're paying more to the EU, but look at what the EU has bought us over the past 45 years. And uh, if it means a somewhat even higher level of contribution in future years, there will be clear benefits at the same time. And, and uh, um, in, in terms of whether it reduced migration, greater economic opportunities for Irish companies in that part of Europe, 
So I think that's that's I think how we would approach it. Um, on Bosnia, I mean, I think just I, I, I mean briefly, I think uh, you know it was an unfair characterization by, by President Macron of, 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 of the country. I mean, sort of. Uh, um, I think. Europe keeps you know the European Union for all, for, for all reasons kind of keep keep a close eye on all, on all that's happening. I mean, the EU is now very active in terms of, of kind of counterterrorism and, uh, and security, um, and I mean, sort of uh, um, you know, it was it, it doesn't uh, you know it, it didn't really properly kind of uh, um, um, take account of, of the overall situation within Bosnia. I mean. It, um, Maybe President Macron was just expressing frustration with the 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 the, the, uh, <coughs> the fact that the Dayton Agreement is, is far from a perfect uh, peace agreement and, and, and has led to kind of uh, to, to internal difficulties in terms of its own internal governance. But um, um, but I think um, you know that it's it's, it's um, you know <laughs> in a way it was kind of a caricature because we you know, when you travel in the Western Balkans I mean you know true countries like Albania and Bosnia. And, Kosovo and all the rest. I mean, it's a different form of Islam. I mean, you know, they, they, it's a secular Islam. I mean, sort of. Uh, and of course, yes, of course, there are others who are trying to work against this. But I mean, um, for, for 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 Europeans in that part uh, of, 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 of of the continent um, who are Muslim, you know, they they have a totally different approach to to, to, to kind of uh, uh, governance and, and the kind of basic way a country should be run. And uh, you know, we, we shouldn't lose sight of that. So. Yeah, uh, firstly, on the money, we're talking about a region of 18 million people. This isn't difficult in financial terms, the kind of supports that they might get. And the real financial supports will only kick in once they're around the table at the European Council. In the late 90s, when I was writing my PhD, I did a comparison of the amount of subvention coming into Ireland, the other um, uh, countries within the cohesion group. And like, we were getting proportionately vastly more than Poland was, you know, or any of those states. It was only when they actually got to negotiate the MMF that they could potentially redirect money. And actually, you can see now in the various iterations of the MFF, there's money being taken away from some Central East European countries, uh, some elements of the budget, and there's a kind of rebalancing going on. But let's be honest, the budget is so inadequate relative to the range of tasks that the European Union collectively uh, is engaged in. And there just seems no kind of consensus about changing. And I know it's incredibly difficult, 28 member states, you get them around the table, all these different interests. Uh, but I think we're at a point in time where we really need to stand back and ask, what is the EU budget for? This is part of that debate, I think. But that's not going to change. And I think you know, there's every argument for putting in more subvention. But we should also be very careful about where this money is being spent. Because it also does, to go into Brona's second question, it does definitely fuel uh, some of the underlying actors' capacity to be disruptors. So the very people sometimes that we have to entrust reforms to are the very people that are the biggest problem, the biggest transgressors. Remember when we were negotiating with Milo Yukanovic, who was allegedly, allegedly at one time, the biggest cigarette smuggler in Europe? What do you do? On Bosnia, Macron's comments were just dreadful. And they, it, that was the entire focus, I think, for, for, for understandable reasons in Bosnia. He seemed to be, and I think this was pitched to some degree at a domestic audience, but completely unaware of all the extraordinary number of homegrown jihadists that France has produced over the years. And he might well be better off looking at the reasons for that production line of jihadists and how French state policy actually contributes to producing uh, all of that. There are packet pockets of Salafism, not so much in Bosnia. I think Kosovo is actually much more dangerous potentially for all variety of reasons, but he overstated the case uh, spectacularly. Bosnia is not a jihadist time bomb, and again, for the reasons that Pat has set out as well. And is the EU helping to fueling problems? You know, the old adage, if you are not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. I think it absolutely applies here, and I think everything should start from just a very simple formulation that the Western Balkan countries and Western Balkan citizens are European. That has to be our start point and our finishing point. Good. 
That also has to be our finishing point. Unfortunately. I thought that'd be a neat. And, you know, <laughs> we rehearsed that before. Yeah. Um, um, I, I want to thank John and Pat for giving us a great deal of insight and, and bringing it up, beginning by bringing it up to date. And also, um, I think, uh, both in what they said and in the questions that they provoked, um, giving the Institute something seriously to think about. We, at one stage, we had a systematic approach to talking about enlargement of the Balkans. This was overtaken by other events, but I think this is back on the agenda now, and not just on a technical agenda about talks, but because of uh, the, the latter part of our discussion, because it does touch on, on very fundamental issues about the nature of, of the Union and about the Union's place in the world, uh, particularly when we talk about relations with Russia, the China issue, and so on. This is all encapsulated in this part of Europe. So there's a lot to think about. I was just, when the money question came up, what occurred to me was the recent council debates, uh, initial debates on the MFF, where 1.3 was being talked about, and then 1.2 was being talked about, and then 1.1 was being talked about. And you were in grave danger of breaking the 1% the thing going yeah. down. And uh, so th there's a huge issue there about resources mm -hmm. and about, uh, as, you, as John said, as to where they're spent. But that is for another day, and I hope that we will be able to organise that other day and other relevant days. Thank you all for coming. Apologies to those who I got the impression were beginning to develop questions, and uh, we, we'll have to wait for another day. Thanks again <coughs> to our speakers. And thank you for coming. And uh, um, as usual, we've uh, opened up probably more than we've closed today, but that's what Think Tank is about. So thank you all. Thanks. Jim.